We're glad to have you with us tonight. If you'll be t- turning in your Bibles over to 1 Peter, the very first chapter, here in a few moments we will look at a couple of verses there that hopefully will frame some of the things that we want to think about together this evening. This morning we were able to take some time and, and to to wrap our minds around the idea of the flaming darts that Satan would send our way, to tempt us, to lead us off track, and to to take us away from the person that God wants us to be. And as you continue to think about that concept tonight, realize, as we've talked about this morning, to, to be able to defend that by our faith, we have to be willing to be people who are going to submit to God, people who are going to magnify the goodness of God, to respect Him and to fear Him, to refuse to give in to those lies that we find that Satan would put out there. If we're going to be willing to do that, we'll have to be a different kind of person than just anyone in the world. We're going to have to be a person who is willing to set ourselves apart. And tonight I want to take a look with you as to what does that look like? What does it look like to be that kind of person? to be holy in these modern times. And as we consider that concept, I I would like to take for our text tonight, 1 Peter, the first chapter, and you look here, beginning back in verse 13, I know I've got verse 16 up there, but starting back in verse 13, and just let that kind of sink in as to what Peter's saying there. We'll come back to it maybe a couple of times tonight and see what this looks like in our lives in serving God. Peter says, first of all, he says, Therefore, Preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And that's what I would like to think about with you for a few minutes tonight. What does that mean? What does that look like? What does that say to us? To be holy as God is holy. And for for Peter to write this, for us to to be holy in all of our conduct, how do we go about that? And as we consider that together, let's think about some of the differences in modern culture and, and what they think holiness is. And we want to look first tonight at what holiness is not. Because as we consider this word and consider what it means for us as Christians, We have to understand what Peter is saying here. I think it's important to do that and to define that by what God shows us in so many places throughout His Word. So first of all, think with me, what being holy, what is it not? Because sometimes we have different concepts of what these things are. So first of all, as you think about being holy, it's not just a checklist of moral or ethical commands and prohibitions. And oftentimes, that's how we might think about what holiness is. We equate our holiness with our ability to to maintain some sort of ethical purity or uh, some sort of conscientiousness. And sometimes as people think about what holiness is, they look to this kind of idea of, well, thou shalt do this or thou shalt not do this. And even those in the world, as they think about what holiness might be, that's, that's where they might go with it. That you should pray, and that you should worship, and that you should love your neighbor, and that you should study your Bible. And they kind of go back to the Ten Commandments, and that's the concept of what specific holiness is. Or you shall not do these types of things. And while all of those things are biblical concepts, that in and of itself is not what being holy is all about. As we consider other things about what holiness is not, holiness is not a self-righteous high ground of moral superiority. It's kind of a mouthful. But when you think about what that means and what that means for us, it's really an accurate description of, of what things are. We all know the phrase, holier than thou. You may have heard that said before. Maybe uh, others have said it to you. Well, as you, think, as you look into that, that describes a person who has kind of an inflated sense of self-worth, maybe a condescending attitude, towards others, or someone who feels that they are better than others in some way. 
And having holiness is, of course, not that. That's not what the Bible says. It's not just having that self-righteous attitude. And that phrase that we find, holier than thou, is actually found in the Bible, that concept at least. When you go back to Isaiah 62 and, and read a few of these verses together, notice as this rebuke comes from God through the prophet Isaiah, what he says. In verse 2, he says, I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually continually sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks who sit in tombs and spend the night in secret places who eat pig's flesh and the broth of tainted meat is in their vessels who say keep to yourself do not come near me for I am too holy for you these are smoke in my nostrils a fire that burns all the day behold it is written before me I will not keep silent but I will repay I indeed will repay into their lap both for both your iniquities and your father's iniquities together, says the Lord. So when you think about this concept of this holier than thou or us thinking of ourselves in a self-righteous way, you see how God looks at that and how he condemned that. And he uses this idea of smoke in the nostrils. Have you ever been too close to a fire? Or have you ever been someplace where smoke starts rolling off and you breathe that in, it burns. It doesn't feel good. It's repulsive to you. You want to get away from that that's how God says he feels about that attitude. And that's certainly not what holiness is. Holiness is not hypocrisy and just thinking ourselves to be righteous. Holiness is not a feeling. It's not a satisfaction that's derived from just doing something good. And as we move through some of these thoughts tonight, I, think, I hope that you'll see that it's not something that we can even derive from ourselves. It's something that we need to find through the righteousness of God. What else is it not? Well, it's not just an attribute describing different people of God. Sometimes when people think of the idea of holiness, they think of um, priests and prophets and apostles and that those are holy men of God. And when you get it to the modern day, they, they think about others. We'll talk about that here in just a second. But sometimes do we view holiness as something that has to do with, with the Old Testament and has to do with the high priest and has to do with some of the things that, uh, that they did or how they dressed. You think about a verse like Exodus chapter 40 and verse 13. It says there, "...and put on Aaron the holy garments." that you anoint him and consecrate him, and that he may serve me as priest, and you shall bring his sons also and put their coats on them and anoint them as you anointed their father, that they may serve me as priest. God had a purpose for what he was doing here, but the fact that they dressed that way and were designated as something in and of itself was not holiness. And we don't want to view it that way. Let's discover later as we consider these things how God taught priests and prophets and apostles the concept of holiness to set them apart from the people that were around them and that God wants us to be set apart in certain ways as well. Well, holiness is also not just a character virtue for what I've got turned up here as advanced Christians. Sometimes people will think of the idea about being holy and they'll say, well, that's for uh, the elders or the deacons or someone who's been mature in Christ for a long time. That's, that's for someone who uh, is able to really get into to what God says and to really understand it. That's not just for the average person. That's also a false concept. Sure, as we look at some of the qualifications for elders and deacons and, and those who are going to spread the word of God, it talks about the kind of people that they ought to be, but those are things that all of us need to strive to be. It talks about elders in 1 Timothy, that, that they need to be sober-minded and above reproach and self-controlled and respectable. And over in Titus, he uses the word holy as he describes some of those qualifications, that they're to be hospitable, lovers, uh, lovers of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. But holiness is not just that. It's not just for those type of people. Later, as we look through some of these things, we'll see that Holiness is a state of being that God desires from all mankind, not just a chosen few. But also, holiness is not just what I've called here a, a compartment in our religious life. Let me, show, let me explain what I mean by that. Sometimes we can view ourselves as having different areas or compartments in our life. We have our, our family life. We have our work life, we have our home life, we have our religious life sometimes that we look at things like that. Does holiness seem like some impression 
or appearance of righteousness that we put on when we assemble for worship or when we come before God or when we're doing something that has to do with our religious life. I hope that's not how we look at it because we're to be servants of God and fulfilling all of His commands all the time, not just putting something on for others to see. You remember what Jesus wrote in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 22 and 23. He says, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work, you workers of lawlessness. Something that is just an impression that we give to others is not holiness. God can see through the heart of man. Hold the holiness that he desires is more than just some sort of religious veneer that we might put on for a time to come before him. It's more than just a public impression that we give approval, um, that gives us approval amongst our fellow Christians. True holiness is something that consumes us. It's something that's a part of us and that we, uh, that we must have. So as you, as you start to think about this and we, we think about how we view holiness all the way around, is this something that is attainable? Is it something that we can have? If it's not all of these things in and of themselves, then, then what is it? Is it something that we, can, that we can put on? Well, since Peter calls us to be holy, just as God is holy, if he is calling us to do that, and one element of God's holiness is that it is absolute, it is an absolute absence of sin in his being, he has complete purity, not even a trace of defilement. So, if we are being called to be holy, can we do that? Is that what God requires of us? How can we attain holiness if we have sinned? Well, we need to think about then, what is holiness? If we know what it's not, then what is it? And how can we do just what Peter is asking us to do? And how can we do it today? We need to understand that holiness comes from God. And as we consider what it is that he is asking of us and how he tells us to obtain that, realize who God is. God has many attributes. We can read throughout his word and find in so many different places, so many different of his people and his followers describing who he is. God is a God of love and of justice. He has mercy. He is all-knowing. He is a God of truth. And we read through Psalms and Proverbs and hear the, the musings of kings and prophets and followers of Christ and God, and they tell us all about these things. But God also is holy and has this attribute of being holy. Leviticus 19.2 and, and 1 Peter 1.16, both Old and New Testament, show us absolutely that God is holy. So as we consider that, for us to be holy, we must understand what holiness is and first and foremost realize that it comes from God. When we look throughout his word, we see that God is declared as holy. Notice a few passages with me and, and, and let this kind of permeate what you see here. As we think about those who stood before God, especially those who were actually physically in some sort of the presence of God. I'm thinking about like Moses or those in the Old Testament where they had direct interaction with him. Maybe is a better way to say it. Where God spoke to them in direct ways and they recognized how holy that he was. Exodus chapter 15. When you read this here in the Song of Moses, he says, Who is like you, O Lord among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love by the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. God is declared as holy in many things that we read. 1 Samuel chapter 2, when you consider Hannah and what she's saying, there is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Or Here's the ones that maybe we're more familiar with, and it kind of leads us to, to thinking about how holy God is as we read some of these things, Isaiah. And you can read several verses here in the beginning of chapter 6. I've just got three up here for the sake of our time tonight. 
Remember what Isaiah sees in this vision and remember what he says. It tells us here in the year that King Uzzah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, two covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And, he, and called to one another and said, notice, notice how it's worded here, and notice what he says. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. There's something interesting about this. In Jewish liturgy, when something is incredibly important, it's mentioned twice on purpose. And if you consider that for a moment, all throughout the Bible you see that in different places. Notice this with me here. In John chapter 5, and verse 24, for instance, where Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes who has sent me uh, has eternal life. And he talks about what that means. Jesus is signifying here that his hearers should listen very carefully to what he's saying because what he's saying has great importance. He's talking about the idea of eternal life. But you look at some of these other references. Also, the idea of mentioning someone's name twice in a row conveys an idea of great intimacy or great urgency in what you are saying to them. And these references that I have here in Genesis and Exodus and Samuel, where these names are mentioned twice, Abraham, Abraham, or you think Moses in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, where God calls to Moses and he says his name twice. There's a specific reason why that's done in Jewish language and Jewish liturgy. And we see it with Jesus on the cross as well. 27, Matthew 27, and verse 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemna sabachthani, what that is, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? So, if we know that and we can see that in the Bible and we can see how that plays into things, when a word is repeated three times in Scripture, holy, 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 it is of the utmost importance. And as we're thinking about what is holiness, God. God is holiness. First and foremost, this attribute of God's holiness is mentioned a couple of different times this way. Revelation, the end of the Bible, in chapter 4 and verse 8, where the four living creatures, again, uh, are in the presence of God and it describes them in a very similar way that we just saw in Isaiah. And notice it says there in the middle of that verse, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. This attribute of God's holiness is repeated three times by heavenly beings who are giving revelations, giving revelation to man. In both Isaiah and John's vision, they constantly declare the holiness of God. So what's the significance of it being declared not just holy, but holy, holy, holy? Well, God's holiness is the only attribute that I can find in Scripture that is repeated three times for emphasis in a row like that. And it kind of signifies to us that this is one of the predominant attributes of God. The importance of His holiness is part of His being. God's holiness pervades His entire being. That is, His love is a holy love. His mercy is a holy mercy. His anger and wrath are holy, as we talked about this morning. He's justified in all of those things. And the fact that this word is repeated like that shows a state of completeness. It shows a state of absoluteness. So in both Isaiah and Revelation, this word holy that's used three times emphasizes God's holiness and conveys its completeness to us. So as we look throughout the scriptures, we see God is declared as holy. But also as we consider what else it says, God is defined as holy. Think about that with me in a few places. Holiness, when you look at the actual definition from the Greek and, and Hebrew words, it means to be set apart. It means to be different, in particular different from another or from another that is lesser. It means to be sacred. So when we consider what was said three times about God and emphasizing that that's part of everything that He is, think about how set apart He is, how different he is. Why he is considered to be holy. And as we do that, 
Look at some of these passages with me. Some of these ways may not be necessarily how you would immediately think about the holiness of God, but let's try to understand how God is defined as holy. He's defined as holy first and foremost because He is unlike any other. And keep in mind as we're going through this, our idea in trying to understand these things is because Peter has called us to be holy as God is holy. So we need to know these things. We need to know why God is who He is. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. All of us here, I think tonight, understand, believe, and know that. But what does that say about the holiness of God? What does that tell us that He is unlike any other? Well, He is set apart from creation because He is the Creator. So therefore, He is holy. He is set apart from us. There is a difference between everything that you see and everything that you know and everything that you read about and anything that you can take in. There is a difference between very existence. Linear time between God and between us. He is different. He is set apart. He is holy. Over in Psalm chapter 106, and you notice the praises that are given here of God. It says, Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord or declare all His praise? A distinction here is made between the abilities of God, the Creator, and man, the creation. God is set apart. God is holy beyond anything that, that we can possibly imagine. And when you consider Job, Job's a great place to look and to see some of the majesty and the awesomeness of God and what he can do. But look at these few verses with me and appreciate especially what the conclusion is as we get to verse 14. It says here, he covers the face of the full moon and spreads it over the cloud. He has inscribed a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke. By his power, he stilled the sea. By his understanding, he shattered Rahab. By the wind, by his wind, heavens were made fair. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. And notice what he concludes here. Behold, these are but the outskirts of his ways. How small a whisper do we hear of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? What does that tell us or teach us about God? Well, man is small. Man is void of understanding and power in contrast to God. He is set apart. He is far greater than we can even understand and describe in some ways. He is holy. And that's one thing that we ought to remember. But God's not just holy because He is unlike any other. Probably one of the things that we think the most about God when we think about holiness is the fact that He is set apart from sin. And it's important for us to realize that as well, especially as we are called to be holy. Deuteronomy 32 says, For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, for all His ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is He. Several verses show us this idea of God being free of any kind of sin, of Him being pure. The, the first verse here of Habakkuk, in, in verse, or first part of verse 13, you are purer of eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. That's not saying God doesn't have ability, but rather that He is so pure, so separate, so set apart from sin, that doesn't happen. Think in the New Testament and different things that describe God to us and how the writers use those to show us that we can trust in God and that we can depend in, upon God. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse 18, talks about the two unchangeable or immutable things and where they could have confidence in God. And he says, in which it is impossible for God to lie. Impossible. Because he is set apart from sin. We thought about James this morning in a couple of different ways. And, and here in verse 13, what does James tell us? Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Why? He is set apart from sin. He is holy. And that's what we need to understand about him. We try to recognize that holiness is light and sin is is darkness. The Bible makes that clear in many different ways. So when 1 John tells us something like this, 
it can ring true in our minds about how God is defined as holy. John says, This message we have heard from him and proclaim to all of you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. All of these passages are showing us something about this God that we serve. God is set apart from sin. God is holy. He is defined that way. And because he is set apart from sin, as we start to apply this to us, because of sin, there is a distinction between us and God. God is holy. Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2 shows us that distinction in one place. There are many that that bring it out. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden your face, his face from you, so that he does not hear. There's one truth that we find there and need to understand. The writer of Hebrews talks about something similar for us there. He says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. That's kind of playing into what Peter has said. It's telling us here that we need to have or strive for some form of holiness. Well, how do we do that? How do we get there? Sin separates us from God, but yet without holiness, we're not even going to be able to be in God's presence from some of the things that we've read. God commands us to be holy, just as he, through through Moses, called the children of Israel to be holy. But how can we? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we've seen that God is separate from sin. How can we become holy? What, What defines holiness for man? And consider that as we kind of make application to much of what we have studied tonight. Well, being holy for us then, being holy today is no different than it was for those in the patriarchal age or the mosaical age. Our covenant is different, but God still wants the same thing from us, and we must realize that the holiness that we can have and should have and are called to have comes through God and from God, and he's made available to us what it is that we should do. Look at these verses again with me and and emphasize some of the things that Peter says here. He says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and what? And rest your hope fully on the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, he says, not conforming yourselves to former lusts as in your ignorance. But he goes on to say, but because he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. So when he talks about holy conduct... That's some of the things that we can think about. And what can we do? How can we, how can we make that a part of our lives today? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And you notice a couple of verses here. It shows us, first of all, that holy conduct must be pure. Holy conduct must be pure. He says here and makes these distinctions as Paul writes, writes these familiar verses to us. What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? And he makes these contrasts back and forth to show us the difference between that which is holy and that which is not. And he says, for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them. I will walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And in the first verse of the next chapter, what does he say? Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Holy conduct is necessary to satisfy the flesh is to live for the world, to satisfy the spirit is to live for God. Consider something that, that maybe you've thought about as we've gone through this. When when you look back at the old law and you look back at the Old Testament and, and you ask, see what God asked of his people, sometimes we think about things like the, the book of Leviticus or the book of Deuteronomy and we think about all of the laws and all of the precepts and all of the rules that those people were given. And we, we spend time sometimes trying to figure out why did God say this? Why did he say they could only eat this type of meat? Why did they have to dress this way? And scholars have tried to figure that out. Well, if God... If God told them only to eat this kind of meat, it was actually provincial and trying to prevent them from getting this disease. Or if they dressed this way because of the climate, you know, that's why he made those rules. We're not told any of that. We don't know that. But what we do know is that everything God asked of them made them different. 
It made them different from everyone else that was around them. They were set apart. And whether they understood it or not as to why they had to sacrifice this way or why they had to keep this day or why they could only eat this and it had to be prepared this way, they were different. And God did that on purpose, I believe, in order that they might know. Well, what about us then? Have you ever had people ask you as a Christian why you're different? Why is it that you don't go swimming with us this way? Why is it that, that, that you're not going to this dance? Why don't you play the lottery? Why, why, why are you so strict about the kind of movies or the kind of television that you'll watch? Why do you wear these clothes? Why do you think it's not okay to, to, to just take a drink even if you're not going to get drunk? There's all kinds of things that people would look at us for and say, why are you so different? God has given us a way to be set apart. He's trying to show us something, and he's also glorified in how we live when we give ourselves to those things. Holy conduct puts off former conduct of sin and puts on the new man. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 20, remember what Paul says here. He says, not that you, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as truth in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirits of your minds and to put on the new self, created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. How do we be holy in these modern times? Well, it comes by giving ourselves to God. It comes by committing ourselves to what he has asked of us and completely giving our motivation to those things. To be renewed in the spirit of our minds and to put on a new self. I, this concept shows up a couple of times in the scriptures, the idea of putting off the old and putting on the new. Think about that practically. Think about how that affects our lives in general. When you consider here's a single man who's lived his life in bachelorhood, has a roommate, uh, has friends, and it's time for him to get married. And he does, he finds someone he's going to spend his life with, and he goes and he gets married. How many marriages, especially young ones, have you heard of or have trouble because he still wants to do things the way he used to do them? I want to go out with my friends and do this. I want to play on these sports teams. I want to do these types of things. But he has a new life, a new wife. He's made a different commitment. And he needs to put off the old and embrace the new if he's going to have a successful marriage. We, we think about it when it comes to our jobs. If you work for a company for a while, maybe you're in a, a position and you get promoted and you, you turn from a, a laborer into management or you turn from, uh, from something administrative into a, a higher-end laborer, whatever it might be, there's different things expected of you. Maybe you have to dress different. Maybe you have to act different. Maybe you have to have different commitments to your time. You have to put off the old ways and put on the new. If you've ever been involved in any kind of counseling, People who go to counseling for alcohol or because they've had an affair. One of the things that's similar in those types of counseling is to tell the person you must completely turn away from what it was that's the problem. If it's alcohol, get all of it out of your house. Don't touch it ever again. Don't go to places that serve it. Don't go someplace where it's easily accessible. Check in with us about these types of things. You completely put off the old. And embrace the new. Those who have been involved in marital problems, the advice that they give is never speak to the person again that was involved in the affair, if they're trying to resolve it. You put that aside completely, and you put on the new. And so that concept we find is what God is telling us that we have to do as well. You want to be holy in this modern time? Then we need to put on Christ. We need to act differently. Our conduct must be genuine. People need to be able to see that. First Peter, he talks about being holy. To be is describing a state or a manner in which we exist. To become holy means that we will live holy, that we will think holy, that we will consider being set apart, and that we will be genuine in what we do. And Peter also gives a reason in, in his second letter, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. I think the bulletin's wrong. I put 1 Peter there, sorry. But in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, he tells us why. The day of the Lord will come. It will come like a thief in the night. The heavens will pass away. Heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the works that are in it will be exposed. And he goes on to say that since this is happening, what kind of people ought you to be at the end of verse 11? To be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for that to come. And in verse 14, he tells us, 
Since we are waiting for these things, be diligent to be found without spot or blemish and to be able to be at peace. So when we consider this idea of of living holy, realize that we must be completely devoted to God for this to be effective. When you think about several of the rebukes that came in God's word to the children of Israel, or Jesus talking to the Jewish people, or even in Revelation to the church of Laodicea, many of those rebukes were because people weren't committed completely. The church in Laodicea was lukewarm. The Jews pretended to be religious but weren't committed to what God wanted of them. We must be completely and wholly devoted to God. And it's for everyone. It's not just for certain people, but as Paul tells Timothy here, it's for all. Not to be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, but rather in verse 9, he who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, or because of, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus. John tells us that we need to walk in light. Being holy means to be set apart from sin. We've talked about the idea of light and darkness. So if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and we see that our holiness comes through God, through Christ specifically, that he cleanses us from all sins. And when God cleanses us, we are clean indeed. He tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. So when we are cleansed of our sin by God, he doesn't just forgive and forget. He looks at us in a completely new way. We put on Christ in baptism, as Romans talks about, and that's what God can see in us. When we put on Christ and we live that way, we are having our holiness through him. Paul tells us that when we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into his death, and we are buried with him in baptism, that just as Christ was raised from the dead and we walked in accordance with him, we too will be raised to a newness of life. So as you consider all of these things, and we kind of wrap this Wrap this up tonight. Those who have responded in obedience to God in Christ Jesus have been united with Christ. They come into a unique relationship with Christ and with God. And it's that relationship that defines and creates holiness. You remember what Paul said. He has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer him who lives, but Christ in him. And because of that, he can can find the holiness that God is asking of us. So, We cannot have holiness apart from God. And I hope that we can begin to see as we consider all of these things, when God calls us to be holy, he's asking much more than for us just to have a higher sense of morality. This call that he gives forces us to answer the question, to whom do I belong? To whom am I giving my first love and my loyalty? Am I willing to set aside the other parts of my life and give it to God? To be holy means that we allow God to claim our life, our interest, our very identity, and with every aspect of our lives to be shaped and directed towards God. Holiness is about our union with God through Christ and in sharing Christ's holiness, which will lead us to a life of holy conduct and grateful service to our God. Remember the words of Peter. I'll leave you with those tonight. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Tonight, as you think about your standing before God, are you living a holy life? Are you answering that call that Peter gave? I hope that you are, and I hope that you can see through the word of God how we can change and be just what God wants us to be through Christ. We cannot do it ourselves, but it must come through him. If we can help you make changes that you need to make to your life tonight in any way, whether that's being baptized and entering into that relationship or, or whether you need us to pray with you and to help you and to study with you that you might understand that holy calling, we would love to do that. Would you let us know how by coming to the front now as together we stand and sing?